Hello there. My lord, you frightened me. <laughs> what, what am I reading? Oh, <laughs> it's just one of my favorite old adventure stories. It's about the Venus transit. It's a story about wonder, about the pursuit of truth. It gets me every time. <laughs> the anguish, the passion, the glory. Seems like these days, everyone's only interested in cool iPhone apps and crude television shows. If only we could go back to the days when science was about truth rather than entertainment. Ugh. What's that? Oh, you'd like to hear it. Well, if you insist. I should start by explaining what the transit of Venus actually is. See, every 100 to 120 years or so, Venus passes directly in between the Sun and the Earth, so that from certain places on Earth, one can see Venus's shadow pass over the Sun. It happens twice, in pairs of eight years. This may seem rather unimportant to your average Frito-munching Facebook addict, but I assure you, the transit of Venus was an invaluable event in the history of scientific thought. Now please. Let us begin. On March 26, 1760, a Frenchman named Guillaume Joseph Hyacinthe Jean Baptiste Le Gentil de la Galaisière set sail towards the French occupied Indian city of Pondicherry. That same year, two scientific explorers, Jeremiah Dixon and Charles Mason, left Portsmouth, England, bound for Sumatra. This is not to omit Jean Baptiste Chep de Toroche, who departed for Russia on a horse drawn sled. Nor may we leave out Alexandre Guy Pengré, bound for Roderigue, an island off of Madagascar. Father Maximilian Hell, an Austrian, was sent to Vardo, Norway. A Brit named John Winthrop boarded a ship from the Massachusetts Bay Colony headed for St. John's, Newfoundland. Neville Maskelyne was sent to St. Helena, an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And Captain James Cook, on the HMS Endeavour, was headed all the way to Tahiti. Were these vacation destinations? Shipping routes? Unrelated voyages of adventure-seeking noblemen? Hardly. These expeditions had been planned decades in advance and were very much related. These were quests for truth. In the early 1600s, a brilliant mathematician named Johannes Kepler searched for meaning in the motion of the planets. He was analyzing the observations of Tycho Brahe, and after years of hard work, he found a beautiful pattern. His analysis forced him to conclude that every planet moves in an elliptical orbit. Using this data, he found that the average distance from any planet to the sun, cubed, divided by the time it takes that planet to revolve around the sun, squared, is always the same number for every planet orbiting the sun. He wrote it as r cubed divided by t squared equals k, the constant. This means that r cubed over t squared for the Earth is the same as r cubed over t squared for Venus, which is the same as r cubed over t squared for Mercury, which is also the same as r cubed over t squared for Neptune, and so on and so forth. Using this equation, the solar system could be measured relatively. Scientists can now make a scale model, but they had no idea what the actual scale was. All that was needed was one distance. The Earth-Sun distance, arguably the easiest to measure, was the missing link. But how do you measure something that huge? Let me now introduce you to the concept of parallax. Have you ever held your thumb up to a beautiful landscape? Closing your left eye, you see your thumb here. Closing your right eye, it appears to have moved. But it's your viewpoint that has moved, not your thumb. See, each eye sees the thumb from a different angle. If you know the angular diameter of your background, you can actually measure this angle by measuring this distance. If you had an unusually long arm, then this angle would be quite small, and it would be reasonable to approximate that angle as this distance divided by this distance. Meaning that by measuring this distance, one can find this distance. What if instead of two eyeballs with the nose in between, there were two scientists with the diameter of the Earth between them? And what if instead of a pretty background, there was the sun? which we know the angular diameter of. And what if instead of a really long arm with a thumb on the end, there was just an extremely long distance with some extraterrestrial object between the Earth and the Sun? 
What if it was Venus? 